I'm from the Department of Respiratory Care. Uh, so I'm going to introduce our speaker, Gabrielle Davis. Uh, so Gabby is a registered respiratory therapist. She has been a respiratory therapist for 11 years. <coughs> she currently works at St. Luke's in Boise as the COPD educator and nicotine cessation program coordinator for the hospital. Uh, she has a master's degree in public health and is finishing up a second master's degree in addictions counseling. Vaping is uh, an area of interest for her. She's seen quite a few folks locally with vaping related lung illness and so it's a passion. And she's presented over 20 times on this very topic because it's such a problem. So that's my uh, brief introduction. Welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Samantha, is, Samantha is also my wife, so that's why she was so awkward <laughs> when, she was, uh, when she was presenting. So um, during this time, feel free to leave and take care of yourself. Put you first. During these two hours, there won't be a break. So if you have to tinkle, go tinkle. It's completely fine. Um, there are a bunch of uh, pamphlets out there, and that came from one of our resources, the Radar Center. It was free for everybody in Idaho. Usually I show up, and the main question they ask is, do you want 50 or 100? Um, so it's free. I stock my department with them. I stock pediatric floors and, and things with different brochures. So all these things about are specifically about nicotine, tobacco, vaping, but the Radar Center has tons of other things about um, all substances. And it's on Capitol and University. So it's open. Um, so the first thing I want to talk about is the word vaping. Vaping came from the industry. Um, they, it's not vaporous aerosol, but vaping sounds cool. Um, so they kind of um, coined that phrase and we kind of ran with it. Now CDC and FDA is using that phrase um, to term the, the lung disease, which is e-cigarette or vaping associated lung injury. But um, just so we know, we kind of use the word ENDS, which stands for Electronic Nicotine Delivery Systems. And you'll hear some other words too, but just know that vaping was created by the vaping industry or the e-cigarette e industry. Um, during this presentation, if I use a word or say a word that you don't understand, please raise your hand and ask questions. In fact, during the whole presentation, you can ask questions. But don't go forward if you're stuck on something which hinders your learning going forward. So stop me. Okay? okay. Where are we we're, as far as students? How many, is there any RT students? Nursing? Social work? Counseling? Radiology? Um, athletic training, kinesiology. Uh, who's left? Health science. Health science. Anybody else? Public health. Public health. Yes. Psychology. Yes. Uh, pre med. Pre med. All right. Did I include everybody now? Okay. Don't work. I have no disclosures. Um, well, Boise State's paying me, other than that. <laughs> so just so we have a general uh, understanding, cigarettes have about 1 to 1.8 milligrams of nicotine per cigarette. It varies on manufacturer and if it was made in America or abroad. But here in America, it's usually about 20-ish so milligrams in a pack and 20 cigarettes per, per pack. Um, cigarettes are combustible. You'll see that in different um, commercials especially. The e-cigarette industry likes to say it's, it's safer because it's not combustible, meaning you don't have to light it with a flame. Um, however, there is a battery and a coil that will still ignite it, per se, and turn it into an aerosol, but there's no fire, per se, involved. Of all any ingredients in cigarettes the FDA know about, that's in contrast to e-cigarettes, nothing is FDA approved to inhale, but everything is FDA approved to eat. So again, when you hear the commercials say, oh, it's FDA approved, it is, it is to eat. Yes. Oh, sorry, sorry. I'm going to be that guy and jump okay. in. Okay. So is it because they're FDA regulated that the FDA knows about ingredients for cigarettes or just because they've been around and studied? Because they've, but because they've regulated. Okay. So first one, FDA, not, I won't even say approved cigarettes, they just knew what was in the cigarette. Now they know all the 7,000 chemicals that happen after it's combusted. So. Um, E-cigarettes aren't FDA approved or regulate, regulated, so they don't fall under the same laws as tobacco laws. So here, like the stores, they don't have to register as a tobacco dealer because it's really not tobacco. It's more nicotine salt-based things, so they fly under the, the radar. 
that's why we have so many problems right now. So in the beginning, we had um, the cigalikes, or the ones that look like cigarettes. Three basic parts. Um, pharmacist from China died of lung cancer from smoking. His son, also a pharmacist, decided to do something about it because he also smoked. And he came up with this invention. This was about 2003, um, 2004. And it was used for cessation. There was no flavors involved. It was actual tobacco in some of them, um, but to help cut down until other countries, America, got it and kind of commercialized it and made it something that we could sell and profit profit from. Um, how many people have not heard of Juul? Never heard of Juul? Okay. So Juul is the most common um, e-cigarette use. They own 70% of the market. Marlboro, um, the company that owns Marlboro, Altria, owns 35% stock in Juul. Juul reached out to Marlboro to buy the stock because Marlboro gets front coverage in stores. So when you go in stores, you see Marlboro in the front. Jewel wanted that too, so they let them buy some stock. The good part is that now Jewel and Marlboro is getting sued left and right because of e-cigarettes. Um, Jewel is a pod-based device. These are the pods. All of these things are up here, so you can look at them afterwards. We have time at the, at the end. So pod-based device meaning they're pre-filled. They're not supposed to be refilled. However, there's a tutorial on YouTube if you really need to know how. Um, people are doing it. They're refilling with things like alcohol and other things um, and using it like that. Juul has two different um, pods, so 3% and 5%. 3% has about 23 milligrams of nicotine in it. Remember, a pack of cigarettes only has about 20. That's the 3% pod. And 3% sounds real tiny, um, which is attractive to a lot of people who already use nicotine. The 5% pod has about 41 milligrams. So it's equivalent to about two packs of cigarettes a day as far as nicotine. The sad part about it is once they're out of the package, you don't know if it's a 3% or a 5% pod. So like the pods I've had here, somebody uh, gave them to me. I don't know what level it is because it's not marked. So, and if your kids don't care about the milligram, they care about the pod. Just do I have a pod? All um, devices are not pod based though, so keep that in mind too. So mods, they're called mods because they can be modified. You can change the coil, um, change the tank, change the atomizer. Um, a lot of people use these. The ones you see in the car that's filling up the whole car with like aerosol. Mm -hmm. It's usually these mod devices because you can get a bigger plume out of them. These are attractive to children but more used by adults because they are easy, um, diff more difficult to hide because the plume um, is so big. And now we're more sophisticated. We have more discrete devices. So this is called the, the Puffet. It's the Puffet one. Um, they didn't make a lot of money on the Puffet one because there's no inhaler that has a, a black boot. This is the boot here. There's no inhaler that has a, a black boot. So they went back and did research after the fact. And it came out with the Puffet 2, which looks like albuterol. Albuterol is the most sold um, inhaler. Um, these were initially made to, to vape marijuana wax balls. Um, but now you can, use, you can put you know, wax balls dry herbs, so loose tobacco, marijuana, and e-juice in them. They, these get so hot, they come with a koozie in a package. So you don't burn your hand. So um, it can be charged with an old Android charger. So This was $98, and I couldn't find it at a store. And I had to search for it online. It was sold out in stores. The kids say the best thing about this is when you drop it, a teacher picks it back up and gives it to you. Oh, drop your inhaler. They think it's a medication. Uh -huh. Oh, you dropped this. Let me help you. Same thing with Jewel. Oh, you dropped your flash drive. Here you go. <laughs> and that's a bigger high to them because they can do it in class and get away with it. Um, something called stealth vaping. So you vape small amounts, small breaths. You can blow it in your shirt, blow it in your sleeve. You don't get any plume. Teacher's happy because it doesn't smell like body odor. In the hospital, they're happy because it doesn't smell like poop. Everyone's happy. Nobody knows. It's, it's real easy to get away with. No smoke alarms will go off because it's moist so it won't trigger a smoke alarm. And I heard somebody talking about school kids not going to the bathroom, and it's very common. It is a higher rate of UTIs. We get kids all the time that avoid the bathroom all day. And that was a practice once reserved to people who are bullied or trans kids to avoid the bathroom all day, but now they're doing it because the bathroom is fajooling and not urinating. So these are things to keep in mind when you talk to, to, um, to different folks when you go, go out. Other devices, this is a smartwatch. I also have, have that here. Um, the time and date works. The battery has about six months. 
haven't ever charged it, battery's still full. So you, if you come up and you see it, you'll notice the battery still full. I can't figure out how come they won't figure out that technology for cell phones. But either way, <laughs> um, it's a good device. This I wore at work, nobody noticed, and I always wear long sleeves and I wear short sleeves. Um, this part, this top here, comes out. This is a juice device, so you fill it up with juice, and you put the top back on, and you inhale through that little piece. When you're all done, you just tuck it back in here safely, and then that's that. Yes, I'm sorry, what's juice? I apologize. What's juice? Yeah. E-juice. I'll, I'll talk about that a little okay, bit. Sure. So juice is a pod-based device. I mean, it comes with a, a pre-filled oh. pod like this. Yeah. This is, these some devices you put e-juice into, you, you fill them up. We'll talk a little bit more about e-juice, too. So did you say that the watch doesn't actually work, or it does work? No, it works. So Time and date. Yep. And it shows that your battery power, because you don't want to get low if you're using it. So it kind of gives you a... Mine hasn't got low yet. I'm pretty sure it's still... Oh, I've got three bars left and so forth. Other devices, this is the Soren device. They come in like four or five different colors. Yellow is the most popular because it looks like a highlighter. Um, in March, I did a, a presentation about kick butts day <coughs> on the pediatric floor. And um, I had lungs set up, and people would come by and look at it, parents. Um, and, you know, mess with it. Then when parents come back by, bring out vapes so they can be aware, because a lot of parents don't know how they look, or adults don't know how the devices look because they're so stealth. And mom said, oh, my daughter would never. So in my head, I'm like, oh, better daughter vapes. This is always the parents say, oh, my, you know, I got a, a great kid. It's not about a great kid, it's about addiction. Um, Anywho, mom came back later to find a quiet space to use the phone and looked down. She was like, that's on my daughter's bedside table right now. Took off down the hall. And it was, it was this one that she had. She was like, I didn't think about why is my daughter carrying a highlighter to be admitted into the hospital. Um, and she could do it in a room. And nobody would know. It smells great. Everybody's happy. This is a Soren-based device. This one, this top comes off. And this is a juice device. You fill it with juice. They also just came out not too long ago with disposable ones, so pre-filled also. So this, you don't change out the bottom, you just change out the top. This is also a similar device, very stealth. When people cut little parts in their book bag to stick it in, to hide it, um, similar to Jewel. This is a vape hoodie. Um, the white one was, I have a, a hoodie down here, and it was, cheaper and it was on clearance because it's white and you can see the openings where you can hide it at more clear. The black one I have is thinner and short sleeve and it'll cost more because you can't see as much because it's all black. You attach a vape to one end, they come with a bunch of different uh, attachments on the end and you can put your favorite device on one end and hide it. You can vape out the other end. Now what's interesting is, you know, this picture is from the w a website and they have an adult using it, but I don't know any adult that chews on hoodie strings. So as the industry is saying that, oh, it's not for, you know, it's not for kids, how many adults chew on hoodie strings? So those are some things to keep in mind. These are things that you know, a lot of the, the companies are called discreet vape, where you would have to be discreet if you're old enough to use it. Other thing which I also have up here, this is a book bag, so it kind of looks like a camel bag. Um, there is space for you to put in the, the water carrier. So you can have water on one side and, and vape on one side. This is, they're kind of made the same. You attach your, your favorite device um, to the end of it, and then you vape through there. So, you know, you can have it handy when you're hiking or something like that. So, so when we talk about e-juice, um, a lot of times you'll hear people in whatever field you're in say, like, oh, I'm down to three milligrams, which sounds like, you know, a small number of e-juice, or I'm down to this, or I'm down to that. But what they don't know, most people don't know, um, is that it's per ml. I mean, everybody know kind of what an ml is, like a little, little drop. So instead of this bottle, so this looks like a 30, or I can't see what it, which one it is. 30, so 30 mls, but it's 18 milligrams per ml. So if somebody has a device that holds 10 mls, and let's say, let me go to another one. So, cause that, so this is a 50 milligram per ml. So say if they had a device that holds 10 mls, and they fill it up, that's 500 milligrams of nicotine. And that's only if they don't refill it in a day. So if somebody can go through 500 milligrams of, of nicotine um, in a day. These are the things that's important, especially if you think about withdrawal. So if you see somebody, and they, you know, they've been around you for a while, they haven't been able to go outside or sneak away, they kind of start acting weird, nauseous, agitated, 
sweaty, um, a little anxious, consider withdrawal from nicotine. So it's different for me. I work in a hospital and at other places, but predominantly in a hospital. Um, I've never seen an adult that smoked a pack of cigarettes and, and nicotine withdrawal. The first time I've seen nicotine withdrawal was a 17-year-old. That's because he used so many pods a day down to nothing when he came in the hospital. So just keep that in mind. I know we kind of give people a hard time who smoke and who vape, um, parents especially, or guardians especially, because the first thing you do when you catch them is you take it away and you scold them and they, they get on punishment. But what if it was heroin? Would you take it away and scold them and put them on punishment? You would get some help. They're using the same receptors, and I'll get to this a little bit uh, later, but I'm on soapbox. Um, they use the same receptors that cocaine, alcohol, and heroin use dopamine. So instead of taking the things away from them and scolding them, let's find them some help. Let's get them some counseling. Treat it as you would any other addiction. Any questions about what I just said? Homework. So the milligram, milligrams um, do matter. In pods, they use, they use a percentage. But so in jewel pods, is uh, per 0 0.7 ml. So they have like a different um, calculation. But you can always go with um, one milligram per ml, whatever it is, 50 milligrams per ml. Um, they have some 100 milligram bottles. It's harder for me to get my hands on those. They're coveted and <laughs> kind of underground, but they go up pretty high. And you know, the bottles I have all were less than 15 bucks, which is cheaper than buying three packs of cigarettes. But again, a lot of youth and some adults don't understand the milligram, they just understand the flavors. It's over 16,000 flavors. So they're not going for that. Like, oh, I need a higher, I need more nicotine. It's like, oh, let's try this new flavor. Oh, it's on sale, 50 milligrams on sale, I get that. So keep those things in mind. So let's talk about some of the current hysterias, the pneumonias, um, lipoid is the most popular one. These are the, the cause of people dying. Those 47 plus people have died um, over since, since August now from e-cigarette related um, lung injuries. Lipoid, lipoid is fat, so fat doesn't exist in the lungs, um, and we've noticed as people have been using these products, the people that have died or been affected by these, they have fat on the, the slides they get and they test, um, like in a lab, it's, they've noticed oil. The things that um, e-cigarettes have, them, they're based in vegetable glycerin and propylene glycol, which is oily. So now we're seeing people with oil in their lungs where it wouldn't exist before. There's not a lot of research because nobody inhales oil on purpose. Normally, so all the people that are currently vaping are participating in research for free. Um, it's difficult to diagnose in adults because we all have a comorbidity. All of us have something else wrong with us right now. Whether we know it or not, we all have a comorbidity um, likely. However, it was diagnosed first in a child because if we see a crappy um, pneumonia or a crappy x-ray or something with a child, we're going in, let's go get a sample, let's see what it is. You know, if it's an adult, here's your antibiotics. You know, take deep breaths, drink a lot of water, and, and, and there is your treatment. But we treat kids differently than we do adults. So they start looking at um, kids' x-rays more closely and notice that they had oil in them and then start testing adults after that. So it's likely been more deaths than that, but we haven't checked. Probably more than 47. Um, so do you know much about the vitamin E? So you mentioned there's the propylene glycol and there's mm -hmm. the vegetable glycerin, but I've been reading about some vitamin E related yeah. stuff too. So CDC and FDA, they're, first of all, those are the main bases, propylene glycol and vegetable glycerin. CDC and FDA are trying to figure out if it's one thing. Vitamin E was the most recent thing they've been tested. If you look on the CDC and FDA site, they say we're looking at vitamin E, but we still don't know if it's one thing inside of it. There are other chemicals, diacetyl, depends on the manufacturer. And really, we don't know because none of it's FDA approved. So they could put anything on the bottle. We still really don't know unless it's tested. But they found, you know, benzoic acid, diacetyl is what causes popcorn lung. We've heard, you know, the term popcorn lung before. But it's tons of different chemicals in the CDC. They can't say if it's one or the other. Yeah. Um, do they know if the oil stays in the lungs permanently or if eventually? We don't. Happen? Everybody's, we, it'll probably take about 10 years. We don't know. Currently, it's treated with high dose steroids, like super high, like 120 milligrams to 500 milligrams. But we don't know how to get those things out. There is no tool we have that can go and clean out oil from your lungs. Not yet, anyway, because we haven't had to do it before. Um, most of the physicians say that once somebody has had an injury from vaping, they'll probably all have last long, long lasting effects. Um, they'll always have some lung damage, but we don't know besides that. We don't know Studies are coming out every day. 
So is it mostly with a bronch or a BAL that they're diagnosing these, Both. or is it post-mortem? They, no, they do bronc and B BAL is bronchial, bronchial alveolar lavage with folks that don't know. But they do both to get a sample. Um, that's where the fat shows up. That's where the fat shows up. It, turn, it looks like a red circle on the slide. Yes. Is there any studies on secondhand exposure? There are maybe one or two <coughs> studies on secondhand exposure. But secondhand exposure is a thing. It is bad. And because it's moist, it's heavier. Um, so it's likely worse. The last study I read was saying that um, a person died and they had cobalt, looked like somebody had inhaled cobalt, cobalt or miner's lung from it, and some of that from the, the spouse that didn't pass away, but they got a sample from it, it looked the same way. So secondhand smoke is bad um, with vaping, and so is thirdhand smoke. Anybody know what thirdhand smoke besides these two? So thirdhand smoke is what's left on your clothing and in your house, like if you smoke or vape what's left on surfaces, soot. So when you have people that say, oh, I only smoke outside, and they come in and pick up the baby, and babies are gross, I mean, babies are cute, but also <laughs> babies are gross, because they put everything in their mouth. So um, babies and small animals are affected mostly by third-hand smoke. Sm third-hand smoke was actually attributed to seeds for a number of years, because the common denominator was a parent who only smoked outside. So those are all things to, to consider, especially because the the aerosol that comes out is so much heavier, it's more sticky. We've had, I had one kid in the presentation and he said he baked on, on his phone and he touched it with his finger and it was oily. Like he just blew out on his phone and it was just oil. Right, so second hand and third hand smoke is, is a thing. All right, so addiction, we know it's a lot of stigma involved with, with addiction. This is something I mentioned mentioned before, all the things and all the resources we have for people who are addicted to meth or heroin. And then, uh, and healthcare workers, all of us, are the worst. We're the worst. And we treat um, smokers horribly. Um, but, you know, nicotine-related diseases remain the number one cause of preventable death. And it, and it has been so long, I don't remember when it wasn't. Uh, but we have to take the stigma out of addiction. First, we have to agree that it is an addiction, not a choice. That's a, de a debate I have all the time, but nobody wants to spend five dollars if you're at all, five dollars a day or more um, on something that's doing them damage. Nobody will purposely wants to do that. Nobody wants to be addicted, and it takes most people about 12 to 16 times to quit over a lifetime. So just keep that in mind when you talk to people, when you meet people, don't treat them bad like, oh, you should put that down and you'll die, and you'll get lung cancer, and all these things. Just remember that it's addiction. We really, we all have them. Um, so because the nicotine is so much higher, which I talked about when we talked about the milligrams, it's easier to become addicted, especially youth, because their brains are still developing until they're 25. Some a little bit longer than others. So realize, especially if you catch a child more than twice, it's likely an addiction at this point, unless you find them some help. Right now, we have a population that would never smoke cigarettes. If you talk to kids right now, they think smoking is gross. I've asked kids, like, you smoke? No, you jewel? Oh, yeah. Yeah, you don't jewel? Because they have no idea that they are related at all. They have no idea it's the same substance is making them continue to use it. And, you know, teachers and practitioners weren't able to provide them that information in advance because they know about drugs. They know about smoking, but nobody was prepared to tell them about this, to warn them about this. So keep those things in mind when you are chatting with people. So nicotine replacement, little patches, gun lozenges. Um, there are no guidelines for use with, with vaping, unfortunately. We've been using nicotine patches, gum lozenges um, for many years to help with cessation. They do work if, if used appropriately. But there's no current um, guidelines. Right now, we base the dosage as we would a pack of cigarettes. So if a person uses a pack of cigarettes a day, we would give them a 21 milligram patch. And they come in three, you know, 21, 14, and seven. But it's likely that at minimum, somebody who vapes would at least be getting in 21 milligrams a day. So the first person, the youth that I put on patches, he, um, he ended up with two 21 milligram patches because he used so many pods. He really needed more, but we can't give more than two because it has so much nicotine in the system. Project Filter is a resource through Idaho. Anybody heard of Project Filter? Yes. Free resource, massively underutilized. They will mail you out free patches, gum and lozenges to your house. All you have to do is be 
18 and live in Idaho. Um, they won't send them to you if you're under 18, but uh, physicians can prescribe it. And it's all nicotine replacement therapy is usually covered at minimum 80% with insurance, so you can take that financial barrier out for adults and youth. If you exacerbated the what you can get from Project Filter, you can ask your physician for a script and it'll be covered. So take that one barrier away. So the patches come in three different um, doses. What's important to know about the patch is that you once you take it off, you cannot put it back on, you cannot cut it. So what's important about lozenges and the next side about about gum is that you t tell people how to use them. So we think lozenges is candy. Really, you should treat it like a Jolly Rancher. Nobody I trust bites a Jolly Rancher so unless you put it in your mouth. Um, and so you should put it in your mouth and park it. Every few minutes, you put it over to the other side. Other side. Usually, it'll feel like a, it'll taste like a peppery taste. And then the flavor, which is still gross, will come out after that, no matter what the flavor is. Um, but don't just suck on it on one side. Don't chew it up and swallow it, because then you'll have a stomach ache because you just swallowed nicotine. Then you'll say it didn't work then you'll be against trying it again. So make sure if you talk to people about it, tell them how to use it because we all know nobody reads the box. The directions are on the box, but nobody reads them because it's a lozenge. I know how to use a lozenge. Same thing for gum. Gum, you chew it a little bit and then cheek it, move it over to the other side. If you just keep chewing it, you swallow a bunch of nicotine, you get this stomach ache, you know, say it didn't work, now you're against gum. So tell people this because again, nobody is going to read the box. Both of these, it's recommended that both of these can be used for breakthrough while you're on the patch. So dual therapy is recommended, either or. So a patch and gum or a patch and lozenge. Gabby, can, they, can you get these for adolescent kids? Can you? Educate? Your physician can write a script for it. Okay. I mean, realistically, any adult can go and buy it if you have a youth. I'm not going to say to do that, but they're over the counter. Okay. But they won't sell them to somebody under 18. It's easier for you to buy a vape under 18 than to get nicotine replacement therapy. So here are some resources. Um, this is Quitting is a is an app, and it's specifically geared towards youth, but a lot of adults are using it too. Um, it has a bunch of encouragement, different ideas like quit tips. It's a free app, um, so download it and show it to other folks, even if it's not you're not using it for you. Um, other resources, if you text Dish Jewel to 88709, they'll send you like some encouraging tips. If you text keywords, I believe one of them is crisis or slip, you'll get immediate um, feedback from them. Yeah. Oh, okay. 1 800 Quit Now is also the project filter num um, number that's used across America. When you call it, based on your zip code, it'll give you somebody that knows the resources in that state. But you can also get 24 7 quit coaching from them. So if you're having trouble, you can call them. Um, it's every day except for Christmas and New Year's. Even though those two days are the most common that people call for crisis, because it's a holiday. But they're closed those two days. And 1-800-LUNG-USA, um, that is controlled by American Lung Association. You'll get like a nurse, or a respiratory therapist, a counselor, some, somebody trained in addiction will answer the phone, and tobacco cessation will answer the phone and, and kind of give you tips. Truth Initiative, they actually created the This Is Quitting app. Uh, tons of free resources that are printable. Um, they have some PowerPoints. They may have just updated them um, that you can use if you want to go into classrooms or something like that. If you do decide to go into classrooms, please know the information because youth will try to trip you up. That's like their goal in life is to try to find something. So make sure you know the information, especially for students that have to do a project. We all have group projects. Nobody likes them. But if you have to go do that, make sure you know the stuff before you go in. Um, Smokefree.gov, tons of free resources. This is um, more utilized by the older generation who's still using a desk desktop computer. It's more popular with, um, with those folks. Same for um, BeTobaccoFree.gov. All these have free resources um, that are all massively underutilized uh, by people in this country. Okay, if you're not sitting by a person, sit by one close by. We have any questions? I have to add the third third hand smoking mm -hmm. thing kind of blew me away. So um, 
And on a personal note, we have a family member who prepares holiday meals for us and needs a vapor. Is that the right term for it? Vapor. Yeah, they use a bunch of different terms. Okay, vapor. Anyway. Whatever so, they like to be called. So it, if he goes out and bakes and comes out and works on our meal, I mean, is there residue on his hands? Likely, that, yeah. If you can't remove it through hand washing. Yeah, you can you through your hands, but I don't know about his clothes. Yeah, that's true. shaking. Oh, <laughs> well, we don't know. We don't know enough about it. We just know that third hand smoke is is real. Yeah. We we do a lot of talking, and uh, and Ryan can probably attest to this, and like Pete and, and and pick you about that, and Nick you, because parents, you know, just had kids will go out and use and come back in. And, oh, let me pick you up, Remy. Um, I was gonna say I've been trying to figure out how to word this question. Is the pneumonia usually what brings people just like across the board to the hospital? To the hospital, or is it the addiction? Like the, the symptoms. Addiction? Nobody it. comes to the hospital saying I'm really addicted to nicotine. Help me. But um, they may if we didn't stigmatize them so much. But usually they have symptoms of any pneumonia, nausea, sweats, fatigue, fever. It's the same symptoms, and then they come in for it. We want more people to come to the hospital or see their provider about addiction. I need help, as they would with any other drug. Um, what you said earlier, um, you said it, the stuff, if you ingest it, it's not harmful? No, no, if you if you eat it. So like propylene glycol, for instance, that's an antifreeze, it's also an ice cream. So it's FDA approved to eat, so not alone. It's not going to stick it on your food and you eat it. It's not going to No, 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 you can't use it as a seasoning. I'm just saying it's used on <laughs> your food. So don't, you wouldn't drop it on, on your no. food. No, but uh, there, all the ingredients are fine in different foods. Um, I wonder if people are putting it on their food. <laughs> I'm not going to be able to shake that. Well, I was just talking about what you were saying about people ser like serving food. Yeah, no, because it's a, now it's a different substance. Yeah. Once it's, it's been heated and inhaled and exhaled, we don't know what it is because there hasn't been any research because the FDA hasn't forced them to yet. April 2020 is their deadline, I believe. So there's still a nicotine component. Still nicotine. Now, they do have ones that say they don't have any nicotine, but they did a couple of studies and found 50% of those still had nicotine. They don't, they, they can put anything on a bottle, just like GNC, all those are supplements. So really they can put, none of those things that GNC is FDA approved to. We, nobody's just reported deaths yet or sickness from it. Well, the 49 deaths that occurred over the summer, mm -hmm. what, was the, what was the cause of that that finally that, was decided? It was all from lung disease, all from some type of lung injury, um, a lot of inflammation. It, everybody kind of looks different, but all had the same symptoms. <coughs> was it long-term abuse, or was it sometimes? No, somebody has died from a, a year. We only did it for a year. We don't know if it's a lot of news reported THC. We don't know because again, nothing, none of, nothing is regulated. Or a lot of the vaping companies say, "Well, it's the black market ones." But again, black market—if you got it off the street or in the store—it's still not regulated. We don't know what's in it. Everything that's in this bottle, I can go buy at the grocery store to make. All the recipes are on YouTube. You don't need a, a dealer, you know, to, to make the juice or the things that's inside of it. People are refilling them with alcohol. A lot of people are smart enough to know you'll be inebriated faster if you inhale it, um, but not smart enough or intelligent enough to think about, maybe I shouldn't inhale it. You know, so. so just like, because I don't know. Yeah. Why are they allowed to sell it then? Like, is they, you said they're like flying under some radar. Like, what radar is that? Are because they're not classified as a tobacco product. Okay. So just like GNC, they're saying it's a health supplement. Vaping was initially initially put out as something to help you quit smoking. So they just like they don't know what it is. They don't like, know. Like you were saying, nobody knows what it is. So they don't know how to. But now they have sanctions now, so they ha they have to do certain things. You know, like follow certain laws by a certain time. So before they used to put in uh, patents for it, and every time they got denied, it would change like one thing, or you know, because the process takes forever with the FDA. So most drugs take 10 years before it before it comes out. So they have ways to kind of to kind of get around it. Now because there's so much pressure on FDA, they're starting to do more things about it. Every Thursday, I participate in a phone call with FDA, CDC, NIH, and we're just catching up on all the new things before they put it out on the website. So every week is new things. We're finding out more and more. So the regulatory process just can't keep up. They, they can't, can't make laws fast enough. But Massachusetts has been the only state to um, ban all flavored nicotine products. What's different, Michigan was the first to attempt it, then they repealed it. What's different about Massachusetts, they, they banned flavored cigarette products too, all tobacco products too. 
So a lot of cigarettes have menthol in them, mint and menthol flavor. So they banned those two, ban all the flavors, and then they added a 75% tax increase to all Ann's products. So it's been the longest so far to stay, to stay banned. We're gonna add more and more things like that to punish them to do it. Okay, so the next four slides, um, they have the information about a person. So with your partner, whoever you're talking about it with, talk about how you would educate this person about their use. So somebody can do number one, a group can do number one. It's okay if I move to number two? Yes. Yes, okay. Maybe these three groups can do number two? One, two, three. Not you. Uh, three, maybe we could do the back one, the back these three. And then these two will do. No, you're number four. And you're number four. And then last group, number four. Group one, what you come up with? Do you want to go back to that one? I just want to. Yeah. No pressure. <laughs> Didn't he increase it by eight times? Yeah. So if you go up to two 5% pods, it's about 80 milligrams a day. And before that was only 10 milligrams. Yeah. And that's how they want them to think like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm doing better. I'm just using, I'm only using two pods. It's only 5% because they, nobody's going to deep dive and go look online and see what 5% is. 5% sounds like a small number. Most people that smoke cigarettes don't know how many milligrams is in a pack of cigarettes. But this is their, this is how people, people think because this is how the industry wants you to think. Did you come up with anything different? Um, or had any questions? Well, no, we weren't sure how long they've been using. Yeah, and that's what we usually do. They they would need more patches, but we only can and do two patches. Gum or a lozenge. I mean, mm -hmm. if somebody's on that program for, mm -hmm. for even a couple of weeks, just giving them two patches, they're still kind of lozenge. Oh yeah, they still have some withdrawals from it. That's why behavior health counseling, you know, with the counselor, social work, any addiction professional, is also recommended. And then now we, we have something, we have Chantix, which is used for tobacco cessation. It hasn't been tested in vaping, but it will likely work because it's nicotine. It's inhibiting those receptors, the same nicotine receptors. Um, but still, they would still have to use, we don't, we don't know because it's so much. Nobody's tested this much before. Isn't there a reason, that, uh, maybe I missed this, mm -hmm. that is it a prescription limit on the two patches or is there a physiological limit? It's a study limit. A study. The study that they use, the highest one they use is two, two patches. Yeah. So that's set the prescription? That's set the prescription. Now people can go and buy whatever they want because they over the counter. And believe me, some, some people have because they want to quit that bad. Um, I just remember what you said a little while ago about how um, it was started as a way to help people quit smoking. The, the idea behind it in China, that was Yeah, that. I'm just like thinking to myself that it's crazy that they're actually, they have so much more of the nicotine. nicotine. How well, you can keep they a customer. still be considered healthy? Yeah, you'll keep a customer and if you think about it, you know, kids won't think. So we, we talked about Altria, which owns Marlboro, buying into Jewel. Now, as adults, if we sit down and think about it, why would a tobacco, big tobacco buy into a company that's supposed to help you quit? It doesn't make any sense. You know, you might be smoking a bubblegum vape now, but at 66, you likely won't be going in and asking for a bubblegum flavored cigar. You ask for a cigarette. So either way, now you have the addiction, you have to keep it up. So now, if this goes away, people still have nicotine addiction. Where would it go? Back to big, big tobacco. I was just going to say, there's so many times, like, the most common thing that I hear is, oh, it has less, like, people actually say, like, it has less nicotine oh, yeah. than a cigarette. 
Or they say it's not as, it's not as dangerous, less carcinogens. Nobody ever questions it either, except for like right now we did math that took five seconds to know that it's like one pot is like 10 packs of cigarettes. Yeah. And nobody, nobody will look like, well, less than a pack of Humans like, like convenience and they like commercials. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of our information come from ads or what somebody else said and we, we follow. Um, that goes with a lot of things that, that's, that's happening right now. But it's, it's work involved in investigating it. And who wants to do it when they already have an addiction? Especially youth. Youth really won't do it. Like, oh, it's cool. It's pineapple. I want mango. Let me do that. Number two. Isn't that 50 milligram one less bottle? Yeah, one of these one of these bottles is this one I think is fifty milligrams mm -hmm. per ml. Yeah. And I don't know how much is in the tube, but to me it was like in a eighty eight to one hundred and forty four a can. You know, doing a bottle a day, I just thought, wow, that's <laughs> plus the ten pieces of gum. Yeah. 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 Yeah
Um, you know how like on campuses or, or around buildings they have like the non smoking areas or whatever? Mm -hmm. Are they trying to do that with vaping also? Yes, Boise State did just do that. They changed their rule. Um, maybe it's been two months now. Um, have they changed the signs yet? I don't think so. Um, but a lot of people get away with it because they haven't changed the sign still. And of course, they put a picture of a cigarette on the sign. And you get away, like, well, it's not a cigarette. Um, but slowly, they're changing, institution are changing. If you have an institution that you should push them, they haven't. Is it also difficult because you said that it smells good or you can't really tell? So if people are going to be able to get away, they're probably being oh, just yeah. thinking about it. Like now I can smell it and I hate it. Like I can smell it. It stands out to me because I sniff so much of it on purpose. I mean, not in hell, but, uh, <laughs> but um, because I, it's like a real sweet smell, but most people won't know what it is. I don't smell it. It's probably blueberries. Do you think you need to be confused with like perfume or something? Oh, yeah. I tell parents all the time if all of a sudden you have a teenager that doesn't shower on a regular and they always smell good, like assume that it's vaping. Hygiene hasn't changed, water bill hasn't changed, but they smell good, or the room doesn't smell like feet. Um, assume it's something else, like let's check into something else. <laughs> Number three, thoughts? I'm pretty sure that we treated like it was three different people on three bullet points instead of the same person. One person. Yeah, one okay. person. Or does anybody have any thoughts about number three? Well, he clearly, he, she did use it. He just didn't know it? Like the first Never used any type of nicotine before hand shoes. This is the most common thing we see right now. Most common. Prior to, is that what you're saying? Prior, Prior to the use oh, of hand shoes. Yes. I could have reworded that. So, so people are starting with vaping that have never Starting with vaping. Yeah. So if you look into research, resources and interventions, even the ones that some of the ones I sent you to is cigarette based. They haven't been updated. Slowly and surely, they're you know updated to be about vaping. But that's a lot. I can't. But and imagine them trying to get off of that. There's nothing they can go back to because they don't remember what it was before because they didn't use nicotine before. Any I think questions you about? How often they're using the pod? So Jewel says that the pod lasts right. 200 puffs. Is this person using it one a day? Usually is. Usually people finish at least one. Um, when, you, when we talk to kids in, in different stu small studies, different institutions have done studies, they at least finish one. Jewel pots, they say that it's supposed to last for 200 puffs, one pie. But the 200 puffs is based on how smokers smoke a cigarette. Making is more convenient. So 200 puffs for a 40 year old that's been smoking you know, for 20 years might be 40, year, 40 puffs for a nine year old that's vaping because they want to have big clouds and big tricks and it's contest online for those things. Yeah. So it might be 40 puffs versus 200. So can you just, so if you did the math, is it that they went from like 30 milli, milligrams to like 40? Is that right? If they're just doing one dual pod, is that how the math goes? So if it's 10 ml of e-juice, right. they have a three milligram so three times 10 is 30. Okay. And they switch to a 5% pot, which is 41. Okay. So they went up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And they don't understand those things because they don't know. They like the small numbers. Mm -hmm. Oof, it's 5% now. It's better. Number four. Oh, for the first uh, person smoked two packs of cigarettes a day for 30 years. So that would be 40 times three out of 100. Yeah. Um, for 30 years, yeah. <laughs> so they smoke two packs a day, that's 40, 40 milligrams a day. That's right? 40 a day. And then if we think about what we know about addiction, that people's tolerance go up. You know, there's mm -hmm. nobody that does, I just do cocaine once a day. It usually goes up and you need more and more. A lot of things that stop people from smoking so many cigarettes a day is that they run out of time in a day. So I've had, they run out of time in a day because of the time it takes to, to smoke a cigarette. Eventually some go to sleep. So it will likely be higher. So I was feeling good about cutting down to one pack, which we know now is 20, mm -hmm. but then went up to, what, what was it, 40? 40. 40. So we cut down to one pack per day and 5%. Dual use is very common when somebody tries to quit. So they might start and just go to vaping, and so they think they cut down. Like I'm vaping, I'm only doing one pack a day. But a lot of people that start, that smoke at one time, let go of smoking altogether, 
went to e-cigarettes, they start smoking and also. So they end up taking more nicotine. And then a lot of people that switch completely over from cigarettes to vaping, they use it more. So you end up getting more, more nicotine. Nobody's frowning at them as much because it doesn't stink. You don't have to go outside. Any questions about number four? Okay, onward. Let's talk about addiction. This is how nicotine addiction works. First of all, it takes about 10 seconds when you inhale nicotine to go to your brain. 10 seconds. Um, it usually lasts about two hours based on body habits, like how large your body is, what comorbidities you have, um, and how much you use, um, how that goes. So usually this is the, the cycle. This is also very common in other um, substance use. So this is the nicotine use cycle, and I always put this up, especially for people who are not in any type of healthcare field or behavioral health field, so they don't know how to cycle. So you use the product, it absorbs. We know that things that you put in your lungs absorbs faster. Um, you are, have pleasure because of dopamine. Nicotine likes dopamine. You tolerate it, you have withdrawal symptoms, cravings, and then you start all over again. This cycle is the same as heroin use cycle. So when I talk to people, especially youth, I ask them, I ask them how much have they been using? Because kids and adults associate the word using with hard drugs or bad drugs or illegal drugs. So it's important that you use those verbiage because it's a way you can make them understand it's also a substance regardless, a bad substance regardless if it's legal or illegal. Like, oh, how long have you been using? And then I explain this to them. Because they, again, they associate heroin is bad, but doing is okay. Or vaping is okay. So just know it's kind of the same, same use cycle. So things we can do, we can remove, you know, implicit bias. Um, talk about your own, figure them out. We all have them. Um, once you learn them, figure out how to shelf it if you want to help somebody. Um, eventually try to get rid of them, but they kind of stay with you. We all have them in this room, no matter the age. Um, stop saying people who just smoke are weak. Nicotine addiction is addiction. It's not a choice. Maybe the first time you do it is a choice. But again, nobody wants to continuously spend money and be attached to something and need something so much. This is not just true of nicotine addiction, but, but all, all addiction, all substance use. Um, we do this a lot, including me. We're all guilty of it. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be about somebody who smokes. So say only weak people smoke, or only young people smoke, or, just, just, or only old people smoke. The kids are saying only old people smoke. Quitting is not easy. Um, 12 to 16 times it takes my mother uh, quit. It was about four year after going to the hospital. And now she's back smoking, even though she knows what I do, uh, I do for a living. Um, and I, we, we don't stigmatize her, but she doesn't talk about it. She's like, hey, I talked to her before I came here. What are you doing? I'm like, oh, I'm going to go. I'm going to do a presentation. What are you talking about? I'm going to talk about nicotine addiction, subject change. <laughs> or, but because we stigmatize her, we as in people as a human has stigmatized so much, but I've watched her, and I'm sure you all have watched somebody try to quit for so long, it's really difficult to try to support um, those folks the best way you can. Another implicit body is that NRT doesn't work, and use it because we use it. Or because it didn't work for you, it didn't work. Um, everybody's body is different. Everybody needs something different. Um, our job as a person that doesn't use is to support the people that do, um, wherever they are in their stage of quitting. We have to validate them, um, talk about it. I bring in a lot of personal things about addiction. When I, go, when I work in the hospital, I talk to people and say, oh yeah, I understand addiction because I like food. Because now you treat the person like a person. So just know that just because you don't understand it does not mean you can't validate their experience. When you talk about it, like I've tried this in the past, congratulate them, good for you. That was a long time, you went a long time. Oh, you used gum, that was great. Congratulate them on all the success they have had, even if they, they are still using right now or they started back using. Uh, listen to their past. If you're trying to talk them into it or trying to help them, they're struggling, bring up some things that you know have helped them in the past because now you should have built rapport if you're this far along in the conversation. Use personhood as a tool. Like I said before, I disclose all the time. I talk about my mother freely, the people and the things she struggled with um, at my job. On my, I have a, a team of 18, and some of those people is somebody is people struggling to, to quit, 
and their respiratory therapists. So it doesn't matter what job, it doesn't matter the things you know, addiction is addiction, regardless of who you are. But be, be okay with sharing your, your story with others. Um, I also share stories of other patients without breaking HIPAA. But I talk about like, oh, this person did this, and blah, 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 because that um, brings personhood into it as well. Um, make sure you're, you can match your goals. So if you work in healthcare, regardless of where you work, if you work in behavioral health, um, our goal is always to get them to quit. Um, I have a patient that um, was dying of cancer. First time I wanted to go see him, he told me to get out of his room, which is very common. The first time I see him, get out of my room. Um, and then he called me back the next day and he wanted to talk about quitting. He was ready to quit. I asked him what changed. He said he had six months to live. And his granddaughter had a baby and he wanted to spend time with the baby. But the granddaughter wouldn't bring um, the baby over because he smoked. So even though my goal was to quit, his goal was to spend six months with all his family. So, but that's the same goal, if you think about it, because he needs to quit in order to do that. Most of the time our goals do match, but we like to control people. Like you should do it because of this, and I think this. Really doesn't matter what you think. Um, their goal should come first. But we can mix those goals together. We can mesh those goals. Um, I want a job in healthcare. Um, I want to help somebody else quit. That's the wrong tool. Oh yeah, that's right too. I'm using anecdotes to other people. The story I just shared with you about the man on our oncology floor, I'll share with other patients. Because again, it brings personhood. A lot of times it's just like, oh, here's another person coming to the room that think they know more than me. Or here's another person who's never smoked or never used trying to tell me what to do. And people don't want to hear that. So you have to bring it down to where they know you are a person as well as them. Lapse versus relapse. Um, a lot of people are struggle with the, the concept. So lapse is when, say you're on a diet, and you go on a diet on Monday, and Monday night you eat a donut. Like, oh, I ate a donut. You know what, I'll just start next Monday. That's a relapse, because now you're going to just eat bad for the rest of the week and just start back Monday. A lapse is if you have a donut at lunch, and then you go right back to your diet. So explain to them that that might happen, and it's okay. You just continue on like it did just keep going forward. So be okay. Explain to them what lapse and relapse is. Um, avoid fear-based tactics. And we're very good at this, but it's very bad. Um, CDC makes a lot of posters, and I'm sure you've seen the, the um, commercials. It's usually a person with like half a face or like a hole in their throat mm -hmm. talking to people. Um, and those things are good if they're passive. So if, somebody tell, if you tell somebody you should quit smoking, and they say, I'm not ready to quit, and you say, well, look at this. It's not going to work. That's a fear-based tactic. Um, especially if they are already sick with something. Something has already happened to them. Um, so there's no studies, again, if you're a research person, that says fear-based tactics work. Um, I actually had a talk with CDC after, because I did a webinar, and I mentioned it. They were part of the people that contracted for the webinar. I mentioned it about um, that, and then we had a long chat about that. How, that's, how can you use that in a way that's good, and it has to be passive. We don't talk about health outcomes. So when I, when I started um, at the hospital, I work at the team there. We go in, are you ready to quit? No. Well, if you don't, this, this, and this, and have You'll have lung cancer and COPD and blah, blah, blah. But they're already in the hospital. <laughs> like these things, certain things have happened already. So usually when I go in, I talk about their cravings. I don't announce that I'm the leader of this team. And well, hey, I'm Gabby. I was just going to chat with you about, you know, your nicotine use. Is that OK? ask for permission. Then I talk about their cravings and what has happened. And then we talk we end up talking about cessation. So don't bring up health outcomes unless they unless they do. Besides the words that we know how to use, they probably won't understand or they can be scary. Just be cognizant of that when you when you talk to folks. Avoid guilt based tactics, I kinda of mentioned that. So anybody heard not heard of motivation? Motivational interview, we are all uh, probably done it before. Maybe we didn't know we were doing it. Uh, but it's the, this tactic was started with smoke and cessation, the creators of it. Um, it was first created for smoke and cessation and, and now used in a lot of different ways. Um, addiction, weight loss, tons of different things. So it's a thing called ORS, or acronym called ORS, O-A-R-S. The first one is open-ended questions. Um, this is very 
difficult to do if you're a healthcare provider because we like yes and no answers. When did you come in? When did you do this? Um, when was the last time you did this? But when you ask an open-ended question, it generates more conversation. Tell me about your use over the years. Or a closed-ended questions, even though we want them to close ended ends with yes or no, you can say, what's the last time you used? They'll give you an answer, and that's it. That's a closed ended question. So you want to ask things that encourages um, conversation. My favorite one is the bottom one. How have you been successful in the past? The most common answer I get from that is from women who had children. Well, I was able to quit when I was, you know, when I was quit for nine months. And that kind of leads into the affirmation part. That's tough. That's great you wouldn't try again. Oh, you went nine months? Man, that's almost a year. And you just kind of hype it up, hype them up. Kind of like, look what you did. A lot of kudos involved in, in affirmations. I mean, just these are just examples. They don't have to be like this. You can come up with your own. Uh, I like high fives for affirmations. Reflections is one of the number one skills in counseling. So when you, if, if anybody here has been to counseling, most counselors just reflect. Social workers just kind of reflect over and over again until you figure it out on your own. So there's no advice giving. You do it for yourself, and that's why it's called motivation or energy. And then summarizing, this is the, the one I put in here. Avoid accusations and avoid ageism. Um, ageism is, we treat somebody different because of age. Kids, they live in that because they have parent, child, teacher, student. And when I talk to people, if it's a parent, if I'm there to talk to you, if it's a parent in a room, I ask the parent, like, can I talk to your kid? Because parents like to interject because they have the answers for everything. I mean, you'll find out a lot of things if you actually treat the, the child like a person and have a conversation with them. Um, the kids before that I've taken care of before, they've told me everything they use, sent me pictures of their Snapchat screen so I could see it and look it up because now they understand, now they know how dangerous it is and they want to help other people. So if you have those frank conversations, um, talk to them and not the parent when they allow you to. Um, Explain addiction with withdrawal. Kids don't understand addiction. Once they understand addiction, especially the ones that are going through withdrawal, they are pissed because they've been tricked. They are pissed off. And I do that by using the word user over and over again. Oh, you do use that. I use the word user. Like, oh, how long have you been using? What? I don't use. Oh, I thought you used eight. Oh. And then they have some reflection. Like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. um, and then they, they allow me to teach them about addiction and withdrawal. Now, do I know if that, that'll happen once we leave the room, but they'll still be pissed off? I know I get a lot of information, and I know they share all the things on social media. But they say, what can I do? Share it. Share as much as you can so you know it's real and not just something adults are saying or healthcare professionals are, are saying. Okay, so for this activity, we'll have the same prompts. So we'll have the same groups do the same prompts, but this time we're going to talk to them take turns talking to each other about how to motivate them to quit. Yes. <laughs> what, what did you talk about, or can you give me an open-ended question you would use? I love the, the one that you already had up there, mm -hmm. that maybe asking how do they feel, how does smoking cigarettes make them feel, mm -hmm. and then now how does vaping make them feel, and maybe that opens up a conversation about yeah. Well, you have somebody that smoked 20 years, you guys, well, you know, what made you start using it? Um, when you quit before, what worked? Regarding cessation, tell us what you think a day would look like when you completed your cessation program. <coughs> That's good because you're hitting on like the biopsychosocial. Because now your routine has changed, your behavior has changed. Maybe your friendship groups look different. Maybe you had to move because your spouse smoked or, you know, the whole house smoked. That's a good question. That would probably generate a lot of conversation. Any other comments for non-number one people? Number twos. Well, we started off talking about, you know, telling a great job for, you know, stopping the chewing and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, putting that effort in. and. Uh, what, what, what helped you get to in changing that? What helped you stop the chew? Was it just the yeah. switch, or is there other motivators? And yeah, going after their reason. Mm -hmm. What was your reason? The, a lot of times when you ask open-ended questions, you can find answers that you can use later in the conversation. 
Uh, a lot of people, too, don't know how many milligrams are in it. So I'm like, oh, you went down, and you compare, I'm like, oh, it sounds like you did about 88 milligrams or 100 milligrams before. Now it's a little bit more. Did you know that? Or how did you, you know, did you know about the exchange? Tell me what you know about the exchange. I'm um, just adding a few closed-ended questions in there, too, but sometimes they don't know. Um, they'll answer no and then give an explanation. Um, it's a little manipulation involved. Motivation. Any other thoughts about number two? Yeah, well, it's a little bit more of a question. Mm -hmm. do you, so, do you experience a lot, or do you think, in your experience, people are moving towards vaping or ends devices because they're they are the less the least stigmatized? So, here's a person who chews or smokes, and that's like the not cool thing, or people think it's gross, and so it's not that they necessarily want to quit the nicotine, mm -hmm. but it's just what is the most socially acceptable yep. at the moment. Absolutely, and people will tell you that too. Like, it's, well, it's not as bad as, well, at least I'm not blowing smoke in your face. At least people I don't have to smoke, but I do this and we care. Yeah, and that's the goal. You know, it was it was geared, it was marketed as a cessation tool. And I will say that, you know, it is true somewhat that vaping may help people quit cigarettes, but now there's something else. So they never quit; they just switch interfaces. So, but it was marking like, oh, this will help you quit smoking cigarettes. Partially true, but you might also pick up something else and go back to cigarettes. Well, there's that. It's more of a switch than anything else. Any comments or questions about number two? Number three. So, we talked about uh, since she's still a teenager, mm -hmm. um, if like her friends or his friends smoke, maybe that might be why. addiction and things like neuroreceptors, neurotransmitters, and they, they like those things. FDA actually came out with a bunch of free posters based on the periodic table elements, um, and, which are also free if you go to FDA. You can, they will mail them to you or you can get a PDF and print them. Yeah, that's good. Any other thoughts about number three? What about number four? One thing I picked up on from just hearing everyone else on number four was he, this person came in and wanted to quit. He wants to quit. And we didn't really talk about this in our group. Mm -hmm. What other groups said and it, it is you could start there. Mm -hmm. Well, you're here to quit. I mean, tell me about that. What, why what made you, you Yeah, what made you come to that mm -hmm. decision? Um, and that would think give us a lot of information as far as the next steps in direction. One of the good things about when people say like I want to quit and I decided decided to vape is to ask where they got the information from yeah. and then explain the sources that they used to determine that. Because then they're pissed off because they got tricked. Well we felt this guy person I'm saying guy, this mm -hmm. person would probably feel really tricked like you keep saying because he smoked for thirty years so that means he's probably forty or fifty or yeah. I know when he starts working. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. just a lot of pure information for someone like, like this in a non judgmental way would help. Just all these basics that we've mm -hmm. learned tonight. Yeah. A, yeah. It's a, a bunch of little things you can do. And research shows if you even ask somebody about their use, they're more likely to have better chances of cessation. Just talking to somebody for, for three minutes to increase their chances. If you talk to them for up to 10 minutes, it's even higher. And it doesn't have to be talking to them about quitting, but just talking to them about their use. What has happened to make you get to where you are? I'm curious to know about their day. So in other words, they're the pack a day plus the 5% jewel pot. Like when in their day did they use the jewel and when in their day did they smoke? So is it at work they jewel because that's where they get away with it, and then when they go home they smoke, or is it a, like, what's the pattern there? Yeah. And it's, that's interesting in Idaho because it's a lot of chewers in Idaho. And it's because they, they chew and they're outside farming. They smoke in the house. They don't burn crops. They have a chance to burn crops. 
Like, true. People have told me that. I'm over and over again. I'm like, this is a real thing. I'm also from a city, so the whole farming thing is, is a whole other thing. So I'm like, really? No. But they don't want to hurt the crops. So that because that's income. So talk about talk about that. I bring you know economics a lot into it and talk about the money involved with it when it comes up. They'll say something to trigger you to say something else. So they're really leading the conversation, just throwing little tidbits in. I was just going to comment on the routine, so kind of like a combination of what both of these people said. This person has been smoking for at least 40 years, so they have some sort of routine established of when they smoke. So I would use that about when they had their cravings or what their routine was with smoking to help figure out how to. Yeah. And little things like behavior change, like knowing behavior change or knowing environment. And these are things that's used in addiction of substances overall. So a lot of times, you know, our brain is wired to do certain things in certain places. So you know, a lot of people say, I smoke in my garage. Something but as simple as moving all the trash you have on one of your garage bays to the other side and parking on the other side could trick your brain like, wait a minute, this doesn't look like the place I smoke and they could do it differently. Or I have one of my coworkers who's on my team who smokes. She smokes when she takes the dog out in the morning. So she started having her mom come because mom would babysit the dog anyway. So mom would be, be there before she went to work and would take the dog out. So it's simple things like that. If you, we had a lady that retired and she smoked only in her car. You can't tell her to throw the car away, although that would be nice. Um, we changed a bunch of things around in her car. So to show you how strong the addiction is, in the, the driver's, the door jam, she had four lighters in the door jam. And you look at her ashtray, she had matches. And she kept her cigarettes up on the visor with like a rubber band around it to just keep the pack up there. And then in the cup holder, she had a disposable ashtray. The rest of her car was immaculate. The first thing I noticed when I went out to her car, because she asked for help with it, I said, what are these matches for? Are people still using matches? You know? And she said, that's in case my lighters break. She had four lighters. And because of addiction is that strong, she's preparing if her lighters don't. So we switch some of those things out. So like where the ashtray is, we put pistachios. Um, somebody else told me that they use the blow pop. I'm like, that's genius. I can't wait to use that because it'll last the whole ride home, then you'll have gum. But it takes away the routine. Routine and behavior change and environment, those are big things. So if you can even change that a little bit, that could make a, have a positive aspect. A lot of people drink their coffee with their cigarette. What well, if you change the tea? It takes more time to boil a pot of water, steep your tea, then it does to push the button on the coffee pot. So just little changes you can incorporate or suggest would be helpful to somebody who's um, trying to be nicotine free. I have a question about nicotine replacement. Like how optimal do you try to be initially? Like how well can you cover it initially for some, like a kid? Like you were talking about yeah. the kid that you, he really needed, you know, two more matches or needed more. There's it's no guidelines for it, so we really don't know. Um, the kid I talked about used four, five percent pot a day. Okay. That's 160 milligrams. So me giving him 42 milligrams over a 24-hour period is difficult. But behavioral health counseling and in NRT, they have the highest rate of cessation. Counseling and something else. So counseling and, and there's two um, cessation medications, Chantix and a form of Wellbutrin called Zyban. Mm -hmm. um, along with counseling, you get a, a higher chance. Do you, and is that approved for kids? No. Yeah. Wellbutrin is approved for everybody because yeah. it's used for depression. But Chantix is not. Chantix is not. Chantix is not, has not been tested with any use, but we know it's been tested with nicotine. So, so much of it is the education to the kid, like, yeah, once they this know, is what you're going to experience. Oh, they get mad because they want to prove it, prove you wrong. So like, oh no, I'm gonna quit. I'm like, you show me, <laughs> um, and they'll try it. They they will really they'll deal with withdrawals and and they'll try it. Um, Zyban was actually tested in vets for PTSD and depression, and what they found after they did that test is that everybody quit smoking. So Zyban is being used for side effects right now. So a lot of people come in on it already for depression, but also having some cessation effects too. Side note. Any other questions? Yes. Um, if somebody is has been vaping for a long time and they want to quit, what would you tell them if they asked if they should maybe try smoking instead? I would tell them don't. Go back to that. I would tell them don't. I get that question all the time. Now, when we talk about dual use, we talk about dual use. 
Um, we know that a lot of people that vape um, end up smoking again because it's more available. A lot of gas stations don't sell vapes. Um, Walmart doesn't sell. They pulled out. A lot of companies pulled out, but they still sell cigarettes. So we don't we don't tell them to do that. Will they likely end up doing that and both? Yes. But I always tell them about NRT. Tell them about constant push things that are free, like patches, gum, and lozenges. If you, I know a lot of other states have programs like this too. I just can't vouch for all other states, but pushing towards those resources. So Gabby, like from your standpoint, what are the like the per, the biggest two things like you think moving forward? Do you think like Tobacco 21 and I mean that's clearly going to help with the situation in the schools. Right. And I have three kids, um, mm -hmm. two in middle school and one in high school, so I hear about all these things happening. But what else do you feel like, as far from a healthcare provider's perspective, that would be effective? Um, I think we should all learn about addiction because we don't. You know, most programs, regardless of what discipline you are, don't teach you about it. They don't teach you about it. Mm -hmm. But it's hard for you to talk about addiction and understand somebody's addiction if you have no idea what it is. We can all do that without a class. You should do it with a class, like find a person that knows about addiction. But we can do some things on our own. The second thing is motivational interviewing um, because it's easy. Do you think in a group is effective or do you think it's an in, in individual counseling or individual motivation? Both. Well, uh, with kids, they, a lot of them do group counseling. Um, because there's, there's other people there like them, and it's more youth versus one adult and one youth. Yeah. So it take kind of a little bit of ageism, on them to, so they know they aren't alone. Yeah. Our school, so you mentioned, it doesn't set out smoke detectors. Mm -hmm. I have kids to uh, heard from my daughter that it's in the bathrooms even in elementary schools. Are the schools themselves like what are they doing to combat it? They they have people come out, but the, the problem with schools is they ask somebody to come out to talk to the kids, but never to prepare a program for their adults. The teachers, and, pay. and I'm not blaming teachers because, first of all, they, they don't get paid enough, enough to, to be blamed for anything else. But how do they know how to react to kids? Do you scold them? You call the parents? Okay, still call the parents, but also can you talk to them about addiction? Can we talk about addiction in the classroom? Can it be part of the curriculum? Can you include nicotine when you talk about all the other bad drugs? Because they're talking about the bad drugs, but are they including? They're saying don't smoke. So I think that the schools, they do have a program uh, alternative to suspension in certain schools. So when you get caught, instead of you getting suspended, you have to go to four cessation classes. Um, unfortunately, those classes are based in cessation about cigarettes. So they're trying to you know, do something different in that way. But now you get tickets, $75 for the first ticket, $150 for the next. And who's paying for those? The in the schools, they're doing that? The no, the, if they get caught outside the school, oh, okay. they get paid. But, it's important that if we do things for the schools, we involve like teachers and maybe even do something separately for, for like a different program for teachers and clinicians and all adults working at the school and something separate for kids. Because if we can, we can tell the kids that it's bad, you know, but what are the teachers going to do besides scold them? Also, they don't have the time. And to recognize it for the teachers. To recognize it. And a lot of them don't know the devices. During Boise School District Bank Night, they set up, a, one of the things they did was set up a bedroom, like a fake bedroom, and not one adult could find all the vapes in the room. Not one. Really? Okay. So they have to know the devices too, like how they look, what, what they're doing in class to be aware. Yeah. Um, so, uh, with the difference between the amount of nicotine in cigarettes versus the vaping, um, do you think that it's going to be harder for people to stop vaping? Oh, absolutely. Cigarettes? Absolutely. It's going to be, it's, it's going to be horrible. And then when they take it away, I think it'll, it'll be great for everybody, but it's going to make it a lot more difficult. And it'll kind of push people towards probably tobacco, unfortunately, unless we put more money into resource, into free programs to help people to save. Free group classes. The, the place I'm at for my internship, they have to pay for groups to come in and talk about cessation, regardless if you're a youth or a kid. So some type of funding to pay clinicians to run these groups would be a lot helpful, but we're not doing it right now. We're, we're awful, awful, awful at it overall. That was kind of my question. You know, if you, you work with a lot of people who don't have insurance and whatnot, and they say behavioral health and, and um, RT and stuff. So yeah. It's just the money. It's mo money is a, a big deal. There are people that, you know, are willing to run groups, you know, for free. Or, I mean, even if you pay the clinician doing it some money and let everybody do it for free, you know, even if it's a hundred bucks, 
you know, have them come in and run a group for six to ten people, somebody has a hundred dollars. The school has a hundred dollars or something. The hospital, Boise State, <laughs> That's what I say too. Money, you know, for things like that. But money is a is a big barrier, especially in Idaho, with some of the laws and ideologies here, is a big barrier too. Tobacco Twenty One has been shot down because people come and say if they're old enough to go to the army, old enough to smoke, it's a right. Don't take the right away. Or next it'll be guns. If we take, if we change it to 21, next it'll be guns. I'm like, well, I don't think that relates, but okay, that's what we want. But we need more people to go down and speak and, and, and be involved, regardless of you know what your discipline is, who you are. Youth are doing it. It's youth going down there to talk. There's less and more youth and less adults that are speaking about these topics when we talk about tobacco smoking. But they can't pee. They can't pee safely. They don't want to smell it. They're tired of it. And it's more youth pushing forward. There's more youth working with the American Cancer Society than adults. Volunteers. Volunteering their time to do that and not adults per se. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, when we were talking about the schools, we just had a young, a 14 year old um, come on our doorstep who, um, I guess there's a three strike rule. Yeah. And so he had something that happened in sixth grade and seventh grade, like smoking, and then I guess smoking twice, and then he was bathing. And so now he's expelled for the year. Mm -hmm. Pretty and how, and did, did they offer him help? Did they offer counseling? For or helping. Yeah, and, but you know, in schools, or in, I'm sorry, in, in jobs, a lot of times if you get caught with a substance, they'll offer you rehab. But we're not doing anything for the youth. Now, let's, let's say that that same youth got caught with meth several times. He will be in an inpatient rehab. If he got a fight in a fight or something, that would be something more yep. structured. Yeah. Um, have you seen a lot of people who have succeeded in stopping? Not with not with vaping, but yes, yeah, not they haven't used vaping to succeed in, in quitting. But um, yeah, there's been people that got off. Quit vaping. So oh yeah, 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 yeah. There's been people that done, usually it's like some clients I've had and clients other people have. But when I say clients, these are people in counseling. Um, I don't know anybody else per se that just put it down. Only 4% of people that quit nicotine and cold turkey remain nicotine free after six months. We, we need help. Um, what?